All right, everybody, welcome to uh, our teach-in, the Light of Truth teach-in. My name is Ari Weinberg, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Our session is focusing on gender, race, and white supremacy in American history. Um, before we begin and I introduce our speakers, I just want to explain the outline of today and all of the technological options you have during the duration of this talk. And um, then I will continue forward and introduce our speakers and we will begin, begin our discussion. So first things first, we have closed captioning available. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you can see sort of different buttons. There's a button that says closed caption with a CC above it. If you click that, you will see live captioning happening. And I would like to thank our captioners, uh, Krista Benson and Amanda Burbage, who are going to be live captioning for you today. Um, the second thing is that we have two ways that you can participate with us while you're typing. You have both the Q&A and the chat. The chat, you can share all comments, questions, not questions, all comments you have, any thoughts you have that you'd like to share with the general group of participants here. But please keep all your questions in the Q&A because all of your questions coming through the Q&A will allow me to see what you all would like to ask our presenters today. And then I can monitor them that way and keep track of them. So if you have any questions, please keep them in the Q&A and please keep all of your comments in the chat. Um, essentially, the way that today is going to work is that we are going to have our speakers speak first, they'll speak back to back, and then we will conclude with a longer Q&A session where the two of them can sort of play off of each other. Um, so as that's going on, please feel free to fill in the Q&A as questions come up. You don't have to wait until the Q&A at the end of the session. I will very much just go through them and I'll have them organized as we go along. So it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Julie Novkov, who is a professor of political science and women's studies at the University of Albany. She authored Racial Union, a co-recipient co of the American Political Science Association's 2009 Ralph Bunch Award and Constituting Workers Protecting Women in 2001. She and Carol Nakanoff have co-edited two volumes and will publish a book concerning the landmark case of the United States versus Wong Kim Ark in 2021. Next, I will introduce Heather Cox Richardson, who is a professor of history at Boston College and an expert on American political and economic history. She is the author of six books on American politics and is a national commentator on American political history in the Republican Party. She is also a leading hashtag Twitter historian explaining the historical background of modern political issues through Twitter through Twitter threads. She's also the co-editor of Weird History magazine of popular history. And the, so it is my pleasure to first give the floor to Julie Novkoff. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Um, what I'm going to be doing today is sharing with you some of the research that I've been working on. It's um, a book that I'm uh, in the process of hopefully finishing up in the near future. Um, and the book is about uh, war and military service in a historical context in the United States. Uh, the piece I'm going to be talking about today is Black Service and Rights Claims in the Early 20th Century of the United States. Uh, I want to give you just a little bit of background on the larger project first so you know how this piece fits into it. Um, in political science, we study development and change a lot of times during so-called normal times and think about war as a separate legal, institutional, and policy space. Um, but at this point in time, war and deployment are, are normal and omnipresent, and there's no longer as much of a clear distinction between normal time and wartime. Um, so it makes sense, I think, to go back and look at moments when war was an important factor in driving and shaping politics. At the same time, I'm looking at a particular juncture uh, here. I'm looking at men of color who served in the U.S. Armed Forces in times of major military conflict. I focus on the role of the marginal soldier. What are the benefits uh, and boundaries of service? How can considering who is in and who is out teach us about the state and its imperatives? From the soldier's side, what does it mean to serve 
and what can the soldier argue that it should mean? And what does the state ultimately have to grant or acknowledge in order to extract service legitimately? And how much of these gains must be made permanent? Citizenship, I argue, is a practice that requires recognition. You can perform uh, citizenship, but it only becomes effective if the state then rec recognizes that performance in return. So to sort this out, I'm looking at this particular time in US history between the Civil War with its promise of emancipation and equality through World War I, uh, which was of course a time of constricted hopes and aspirations uh, for many people of color in the United States, but for African Americans in particular. Each of these wars had some triumphs and gains for the soldiers who participated in them, for people of color or for both, but each saw retrogrades afterward. It was a fairly common pattern. Overall, it looks like the developments that took place were not all that significant, but what my study wants to do is explore how service and sacrifice were performed, mobilized, and remembered, both in the general population, but among um, the people who served as well. Um, I look at how people of color and their advocates attempted to leverage military service to support broad rights claims, either for those who served or for the broader communities they represented, and what claims were acknowledged and which ones were rebuffed. So in the grand scheme of the book, the Civil War I see as being largely about nationhood, where the Spanish-American War and Philippine War were about empire, and World War I saw the United States moving into a position of world power. Um, but all of these wars had deeply complicated racialized aspects to them that I'm trying to explore and understand here. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk about the Spanish-American War, Philippine, Ameri Philippine Wars, uh, and, um, and World War I in particular, but the story really starts with the Civil War's effort uh, to generate emancipation, which was largely an effort um, that succeeded because of the advocacy and agency of African Americans uh, who were able to make their way into the military and, and directly emancipate themselves. In the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, there was a story about the Civil War as a war of emancipation but by the time um, my story today begins, this had collapsed and the black service and sacrifice that led to these changes was in the process of being erased from the narrative in many significant ways. So if we start with the Spanish-American War, um, you can think about this as a war of empire, but also a war of unification for the United States. The empire that the United States was building had a racial caste from the beginning but also a particularly masculine caste that related to the jingoism uh, prominent at that time. Veterans were valorized, uh, but there was a growth of a reunification narrative that was beginning to peak in this period um, in which the, the Civil War had become framed as this tragic fratricide and the Spanish-American War was a way to bring the two sides together in a manly uh, conflict that would reunify um, the broken uh, halves of the American state around a common martial goal. This left the men of color who served in this war in a kind of peculiar position because they were serving and seeking to advance this American imperial mission, but doing so from a standpoint of being racially subordinated. At the time that this war took place, of course, there were still veterans of the Civil War who were alive. Uh, there were black men serving in the army at that time. They were serving in the West primarily. Uh, and the veterans and those serving at the time pressed for enlistment and mobilization of black troops to serve in the war. Um, existing regular army units were assembled and deployed and the famous Teddy Roosevelt victory at San Juan Hill was supported and defended by the 10th Cavalry, which over the course of the war suffered a 20% casualty rate and saw half of its officers killed or wounded. At the same time, however, state militia units were mobilized. Uh, most of these did not see any action in the war against Spain. They were trained and drilled and then mustered out, often in dangerous and violent circumstances. Uh, there's a, a rather infamous 
incident in Wilmington that led to the immediate disbandment of North Carolina's longstanding Black Regiment. Um, but as the Philippine War gets going, um, and as the, the continued aftermath of the Spanish-American War moves on, officials in the American military believed that enlisting more Black troops was going to be necessary because they were believed to be uh, immune to a lot of the tropical diseases. The Philippine War is often a somewhat forgotten war, unlike the short and triumphant Spanish-American War, but over 600,000 Filipinos died and over 126,000 American soldiers served in the Philippines between 1899 and the early 1910s, including a substantial number after Roosevelt had declared victory in this war in 1902. It broke the simple heroic frame of the Spanish-American War and the aim of imperialism uh, was governance and tutelage. Um, around 6,000 African-Americans served as officers and enlisted men. Um, they were officers over a unit of Philippine, Filipinos who were enlisted um, as uh, army units uh, under, under Black command. The Black troops found themselves in rather complicated uh, situations, upholding and advancing the American imperial vision. Um, the Filipinos, in fact, recognized this, and the resistance uh, tried to turn some of these troops using uh, propaganda referencing American lynchings. Uh, but for the most part, um, the Black troops stayed loyal to the United States, and the Black press made a conscious effort to promote a narrative of Black manly sacrifice and heroism during this war, um, despite uh, critiques of imperialism that were happening in the Black press at the same time. So um, how did this end up going? Um, men who were uh, promoted to officer positions in command of Filipino troops did not fare well. Uh, after being in command uh, for a while, as the conflicts were, were winding down, um, in three cases, the officers were basically drummed out of the service. One man was investigated and found unfit for service. Another was put on trial for sexual and financial misconduct. And the third, uh, Captain David Gilmer, who was a hero in the black press and had embraced Booker T. Washington's uplift principles, was ultimately dismissed for making inflammatory statements about his white second lieutenant. Uh, at the end of the day, the Spanish-American War is the one that the general public tended to remember, but black participation in that war was quickly forgotten, even by Teddy Roosevelt um, in speeches that he gave uh, later on um, during the Philippine conflict. At first, he had lauded the black troops. Um, America became a unified empire that advanced white values and civilization. At this time, we were seeing a number of Civil War anniversary events that prominently brought into play um, white descendants of prominent uh, Confederates and Union troops. Uh, but the, the black troops who had participated were largely sidelined and forgotten in these efforts. At the same time, however, we saw the establishment of mature core of African-American veterans uh, who were important as the US Armed Forces increasingly relied on natural born citizens and um, and the number of intended naturalizers and naturalized citizens, citizens began to drop in the US Armed Forces through intentional policy. If we move to World War I, um, this is in, in effect a story of moving from triumph uh, to disillusion. I'm not gonna talk a lot about the triumphal period uh, for black troops in World War I, but simply know that uh, many black troops did fight in Europe and fought with great distinction. Um, many fought under French command and received numerous medals and honors from the French. Um, and there was an, a, an enthusiastic cultural embrace of the black troops in France. Um, however, uh, this didn't last enormously long. We can see this in a certain microcosm in the position of W.E.B. Du Bois. He traveled to Paris in 1918, hoping to write a volume memorializing the black experiences in the war after using the crisis to encourage black participation. But he began to hear direct stories from the troops and broke with the accommodationists who were at that time serving in prominent positions in the Wilson administration. And he developed a comprehensive investigative report. Culminated 
in the May 1919 issue of The Crisis, which described America as a shameful land. Du Bois wrote, racial discrimination was official military policy and executed at the regimental level with debilitating efficiency. This issue of the crisis was in fact so explosive that it was up, held up from distribution by the Postmaster General for nearly a week. If we look at demobilization um, in terms of the mechanics, uh, when the black troops came home, like many of the white troops, they, they were received with celebrations. On the previous slide, I had a photograph of the Harlem Hellfighters in their famous march up uh, from the southern part of Manhattan to Harlem to admiring mixed race crowds. Um, in Nashville, Selma, Birmingham, and Savannah, there were picnics and banquets and parades for returning soldiers, including black soldiers. And it, in Atlanta, both the mayor and the governor turned out to salute the black troops. But underneath these parades and celebrations, returned troops were placed in segregated camps in the United States before their release from the army and the army itself proved no great refuge. The problem of course was, what do we do with these returned soldiers? Uh, a black Tuskegee sociologist asked, what will happen when 300,000 Negro soldiers return after having had guns in their hands, after having heard about democracy, and after having fought and bled for their country. This was in effect a two-part question. How were the returned soldiers going to resume their lives when they got back? And what would the white response be to this return? Uh, the white response was uh, in some part the Red Summer. Uh, we look at James Vardaman, uh, the former Mississippi governor and at that time a senator from Mississippi, laying this out. Same time that issue of the crisis was circulating, he circulated an editorial uh, advocating that white men organize uh, to control, as he put it, these military French woman ruined Negro soldiers. Uh, it quickly became quite bloody. I think many people are familiar with the Red Summer. Um, what you may not be as familiar with is that many of the victims of Red Summer violence were in fact soldiers uh, who were lynched or almost lynched, some of them while in uniform. The NAACP highlighted these lynchings and emphasized their military connections. The black press's insistence on emphasizing the military status of this, these victims sought to define these crimes as more as assaults on black bodies. They were assaults on the very idea of democracy as the black veteran's body stood as a symbol of manly national defense. And in the post-war post period, of course, we saw that the gains that black soldiers had achieved turned out not to be enormously sticky uh, for either the soldiers themselves or for um, uh, the broader back black population. So what do we learn from this period in the early 20th century? Um, this was a period of peak American anxiety about immigration, assimilation, and civic membership, but it was also a period of black mobilization and change. The NAACP struggle against lynching uh, shows that it did have significant movement effects. And in fact, uh, the NAACP was able to gain some ground with, uh, with Warren Harding, who's not remembered as one of our most wonderful presidents. And at this time, reformism in the South through partnership between accommodationists and reform-minded whites began to get off the ground. And there were some new developments within the black community The League for Democracy comes up. But ultimately there was a lack of durable shift in governing authority as we political scientists like to put it. Um, mass mobilization and demobilization had some effects though. It was an initiation into a politics of total warfare for a nationalist state um, and incorporation was advanced but only for some groups. For service members of color, the crumbs they gained were training programs for officers, troops being placed in combat positions, and Asians were in fact drafted and, and served in World War I. But their performance did not secure the other half of the bargain. So the dynamics of this period illustrate both the promise and peril about thinking of citizenship as a gateway to greater rights protections. It also powered highlights the power of imagination coupled with the real limits on structural advancement when groups attempt to enforce a bargain, exchanging loyal service for civic recognition and state enforced protections for rights. If we translate these lessons to the modern day, 
we can think, of course, almost immediately about efforts to secure LGBT service in the military and DACA and military service for undocumented Americans as a path to citizenship. Invoking memories of prior service does have its advantages, but as this story illustrates, military service remains gendered and racialized in complicated ways. And there's a long history of the devaluation of service and reading out members of subordinated groups after the fact. And we see this also in today's military as it has increased in its diversity. We continue to see a lot of performative appreciation for the military, but often a lot less concrete support in ways that really matter in the day-to-day -day lives of our veterans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, that was awesome. So, so now we're gonna transition over to Heather Cox Richardson. Well, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here. And second, it's a great pleasure to be here with, uh, with Julie, whose work has been so instrumental in um, showing how attitudes in society translate into legal structures. And that's kind of what I wanted to pick up on today is the, when we're taking a look at it in a teach-in at systems of race, gender, and white supremacy, one of the points that I really would love to make is, and that, that follows with sort of some of my theoretical work, is that rather than looking at these issues separately, they really are all the same issue. That is, if you look at the world not as um, racism, sexism, classism, white supremacy, but rather as a pecking order, if you will, or a continuum, what really interests me is where all these things intersect. And there's a lot of ways to talk about that, but I thought it might be useful to put together um, uh, so a, a, a time in which it actually played out, you know, how these things played out. And I want to look at one of the same periods that Julie just picked up on, and that's the period of America after the Civil War, because one of the things that's really on the table in the late 19th century is the construction of America, and specifically the construction of American government, and who will have a say in that government. And it, it's a great place to start looking because we tend, when we study Reconstruction, to look at it in slices. And the problem with that is that the slices really do all intersect and eventually give us the kind of world that Julie just described in 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina, for example, when there is literally a coup to take the government away from a biracial coalition that has managed to fairly win election and return it to white supremacists who literally write a document that says, we will never again be governed by people like them. Um, so the question for that, that it seems to me is worth paying attention to is how do you get from a world of multi a multiplicity of voices into a world of a single voice? And how are racism, sexism, classism leveraged in such a way that some people become the other and some people become the dictators of what policy is going to be? And that to me comes down to the question of who tells the stories? How are those stories organized? So if you look at the period after the Civil War, um, it, you know, when, widely known as Reconstruction, we tend to look at it as a period that involves the Reconstruction of the South, which has been devastated by the war. You know, the the everything has broken down: the social system, the political system, the the policing system, the economic system is all up in the air. And the problem with looking at Reconstruction as solely an issue of trying to come up with a new interaction uh, level of interactions between um, African Americans and Euro Americans is that, um, in fact, Reconstruction at the time was, which I mean, certainly looking at the South is is a hundred percent legitimate. But at the time, it was looked, the period was looked at as literally the reconstruction of the American country, uh, the American government, the rebuilding of government, and that involved not simply the South, which is of course where pe most of people's attention was because of the devastation that had taken place there, but also the North. So you have the South, which has been, as I keep saying, devastated. The, the cities have been uh, reduced to rubble. The, um, the railroad lines have literally been torn out of the ground and tied around trees uh, in what were known as Sherman's neckties. Um, people were dead. The, um, 
the, the whiskey was so bad in Texas, they called it rifle whiskey because it would kill at two, uh, you know, the, the saying was it would kill at 200 yards. I mean, the, the, the South really desperately needed to be rebuilt, but, and, and, and the, the people in the South were, um, the white people, the, especially the men, were uh, completely demoralized. Remember just four years before, they thought they were the, the masters of the universe. And then they were, uh, in, with the space of four years, re returned to uh, a position of um, subordination to not only the soldier, the northern soldiers who had beaten them in the field, but also to their um, their African American neighbors who had been uh, Union soldiers as well. So you have the the, the white South demoralized, the African American South. Um, uh, disoriented, not demoralized for sure, really quite moralized, but disoriented in terms of what is going to happen in the future, and also uh, in trouble for finding food and for finding family members who've been lost during slavery time. So you've got the South, which is a mess, but at the same time you have the North, which has done great during the war. It expected to lose the war. Every president said that a major war of this magnitude would destroy a country. In fact, um, the Civil War did the opposite. The new system of financing put in place during, uh, under Lincoln's Republican Party actually uh, makes the, the, the northern um, part of this, the country extraordinarily strong and, um, and, and vibrant and helps industry considerably. Similarly, the, the North has this sort of moral sense that they have won, that the great bloodletting of the Civil War has um, um, expiated the, the sin of slavery. And finally, and though we tend to forget it, we have the West. You know, the West is also a crucial part of Reconstruction. And it's worth remembering that the Civil War does not end American war at all. It simply moves it from the Eastern theater into the Western theater, where quite literally the government is going to put William Tecumseh Sherman from the South into the West, into the Department of what's called then the Department of the Missouri to fight the ongoing Indian Wars because by 1865, the US government is at war with the Comanche and the Apache and the, um, the Cheyenne and the Lakota. So there's wars all the way across the, the American Plains in 1865. You also have the issue that in the West, you have the US government having essentially reconstructed that Western small T territory into a, a map that looks very much like the present of organized territories. And you have the rise of the, um, the cattle industry and the image of the American cowboy. So you have these three regions, but the question is then who, who, who wins? I mean, who gets to have a say in this new government? Because of course the war has thrown everything up in the air. Who gets to have a say? If in fact America stands for democracy, who's in and who's out? And let's start here with the, the place that we often don't start when we think about reconstruction, and that's with indigenous peoples with the, uh, the Indian groups, Indian tribes, with whom the American government has launched wars, but also come increasingly into contact during the Civil War. What about them? You know, they are the, the continent's original inhabitants. Do they get to have a say in what this new kind of democracy is going to look like? Um, what about, uh, what about African Americans who before the war, African American men at this point, who before the war were seen as really the quintessential non-citizen? You know, in order to be a good citizen, you were supposed to be white, you were supposed to have property, with luck you had a little education. They don't have any of those things, and yet they are the only um, um, consistently loyal population in the American South to the United States government. So should they have a say in, in a new society, in the new idea of American government? What about women? You know, American women in the North had participated in the Civil War in extraordinary ways. Of course, they had gone ahead and sent their, their men to the, the battlefields, their husbands and their fathers and their sons. But they had also on the home front worked in the fields to produce crops. They had supported the United States government with money, with their labor. Some of them had actually fought. Others had become teachers or nurses to support the war effort. Shouldn't they have a say in American society? And what about, um, the men in the North. I mean, white men are pretty convinced that they should have a say in society. They just believe they won the war. But what about Confederates, Confederate men 
before the war, just five years before, they were the quintessential citizens. They were the ones who were theoretically at the heart of American citizenship. So what do you do when you have a multiplicity of voices demanding space in the construction of what it means to be an American? How do you or how does the system include some people and exclude others? And Reconstruction is a great moment to look at that because, of course, if you start here with um, the summer of 1865, we're going to start with the fact that um, Andrew Johnson tries to organize the southern, the, the southern states, which are, have called themselves outside of the Union. He or tries to organize the southern states by getting them to uh, write new state constitutions that are going to accept the 13th Amendment, um, nullify the ordinances of, con of, confeder uh, of confederation, of secession, and um, and repudiate Confederate debts. They do that, but then they go ahead and they do something else. And that's that they say, you know, we need to gain control back over the South. And they don't, they don't necessarily talk about it initially in terms of race. They say, look at the violence around here. Look at the fact we don't have a police system. Look at the gangs that are on the, on the highways. We need to regain control over that and get the fields planted so nobody starves. Again, sounds pretty reasonable, right? But then it turns out they write the Black Codes, and the Black Codes are essentially the, the, the uh, remanding of African Americans back into a quasi-system of slavery. It's not legal slavery yet, but it looks very much like that. Well, is that okay? Does that stand? Um, it doesn't stand because other voices get involved in the discussion about who should have a say, and that would be Northern white men. And they begin, uh, as soon as they get back into session, Congress be gets back into session in December of 1865 to say, no, 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 we would much rather have African Americans back on the team than we would like to have um, uh, Confederates, the Confederates for um, the, that, uh, that Andrew Johnson has been empowering over the course of 1865, we want to put instead African Americans into the body politic. And so we get the 14th Amendment declaring African American citizens. And then uh, when the South rejects that, we get the Military Reconstruction Act of 1867, which James G. Blaine, one of the primary um, politicians of the 19th century, called the most important law that was ever uh, passed in America because it included African American men in the body politic. And then when Georgia tries to exclude them from holding office in the state of, uh, of Georgia after the 1868 election, we get the 15th Amendment saying that African American men have the right to vote. So they are included in the body politic, and one would think that would be the end, except of course it's not. You know, I just took you through 1870, but in 1867, we, we get the exclusion of indigenous peoples from a voice in American society. And we do so with the Treaty of Medicine Lodge of 67 and the Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1868. And those are really designed to guarantee that indigenous peoples cannot protect their lands against the juggernaut of northern economic development. They need to be pushed away from the, the railroads that are going to go through the country, which is why, if you've ever thought about it, we have two major uh, groups of Indian reservations in the country, and they're to the north and the south of the Union Pacific Railroad. So they get written out of having a say. They get pushed onto reservations where they do not have a political voice, where there is nobody who is responsible for representing them politically. And this is going to be devastating to the tribes from then on because politicians who have a say in the American government have no reason to respond to them except perhaps out of moral conviction and moral conviction among politicians tends to be a little thin on the ground. So um, when you get to the, the, uh, the 14th Amendment, of course, a lot of indigenous peoples are excluded from the 14th Amendment. They're the group that is excluded. But they're not the only ones whose voice gets put into this question of who gets to come out as a member of the body politic, who's in versus who's out. And women, of course, expect to be included in having a political voice after the Civil War. And um, when the 14th Amendment in 1848 is written without them being included, I'm sorry, 1868 is included without them being, uh, is written without them being included. In 1869, we get our two crucial organizations of women suffragists in America. We get the um, 
the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association organized within three months of each other saying, hey, wait a minute, we're supposed to have a say in American society. But what's interesting about that is in their quest for American, for, for a voice in American society, one of the things that Susan B. Anthony does is uh, she, she there's, they actually hold a vote in, in um, 1872, in which they try and say, well, we are American citizens under the 14th Amendment, and therefore we should be able to vote. And uh, Susan B. Anthony gets arrested for that. And when she gives her speeches around New York saying, you know, this is not okay, um, I should be included. One of the things she says is um, that um, it's, it's okay to have um, to have a, a system based on race in which white people govern African Americans. It's okay to have a system in which the educated govern the ignorant. It's not okay to have a system in which men uh, rule over women. So it's interesting because she deliberately is throwing, throwing overboard people of a different color and people of a different class than her. And, and this is where I'm suggesting that there is a sense of hierarchy. If she can move up, she's willing to toss these people over. What does she mean by that? She's looking at the time, of course, at African-American agitation for a say in the body politic, but also that of poor workers who are organizing beginning in 1866 with the National Labor Union and later on in, um, in 1869 with the Knights of Labor and who get really uh, tarred as a dangerous force in society after 1871 when Americans look at the rise of labor organizations in Europe, especially in France, and see them as violent and dangerous. So she as well is buying in to this question of who should have a say. And crucially, one of the real kickers in this reconstruction period determining who gets to be a member of the body politic is the idea of who's paying for it. So during the war, the, the, the uh, Republican Congress has created our first national taxes. And by 1871, a number of people are saying that you should not have a say in American society unless you are paying taxes. And they argue against the inclusion of poor workers and African Americans at the same time in inclusion in the body politic because they don't have property and they should not have a vote on how tax dollars are spent. So by 1871, you have a number of mainstream political public or uh, mainstream newspapers, publications saying, hey, we don't mind black people and we don't mind workers. We just don't think they should have a say in the body politic because they don't pay in taxes. Well, it's not true. They did pay in taxes, but they shouldn't have a say because they are non-taxpayers. Uh, and that really gets a grip in 1871 and 1874. Now, crucially, to, to bring this to a close with the idea that what I, it's important when you're looking at who gets to have a say in society to look at how issues of race and gender and class all tie together, is that um, the, the women who want a say in society uh, actually take their case to the Supreme Court after the election of 1872. A woman named Virginia Minor sues uh, the registrar in Missouri, a guy named Reese Happersett, saying that he would not let her register to vote and she should have been able to under the, the citizenship clause in the 14th Amendment. And she takes it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decides it in 1874 with a case called Minor v. Happersett. And with that, it's a very long, um, very long, um, very long case in which it says not a lot, except they sort of go through everything women have ever done in American society. It says, of course, women are citizens. Let's not be foolish here. Of course they are. Dolly Madison saved the paintings from the whites. And it goes on and on. And then at the end, there's a kicker. And they say, yes, women are citizens. But citizens do not necessarily have the right to vote. And with that, with that enshrining of, um, of the right to vote and the ability to, dis to, to cut that away from citizenship, the stuff that Julius talked about so interestingly about the Spanish-American War and World War I, the door is open for suffrage restrictions. And with that door being open in 74, of course, by 75 and 1876, you are going to have white supremacists in the South 
using the Minor v. Happersett decision, not explicitly, but using the principles in that, to stand outside of the polling places in the South with guns saying that African Americans do not have the right to vote, not on the grounds of race, but on the grounds that they are poor and they should not have a say in how tax dollars are spent in America. So um, I'm, I'm trying to lay out here the idea that uh, when we look at issues of race and gender and class and white supremacy, it's a mistake to, to, tie, to pull them apart. It's, it's much more effective to think of them as, in fact, uh, a, a series of tools in the toolkit of white supremacists to say, when can I use this material to advance uh, my goal, but also within that hierarchy, you see examples here of places where different workers, different African Americans, different women use racism and class and gender themselves to try and get a leg up in that, that spectrum. And that identifying that and recognizing the ways in which they play off each other and, and that playing off in the end results in a, a, a white supremacist legal system, the way Julius talked about, or a white supremacist political system, the way people like me and Carol Anderson and Joanne Freeman talk about. The, that, I think, is really crucial to understand um, how we get the systems we do in America. That's all I got for you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Heather, for um, sharing your thoughts with us. So I'm going to let everyone know that they should start posting in the Q&A, and I see that that's beginning. Um, as I give people a moment, I just want to thank you so much both for speaking and thank our captioners for all their hard work, um, as well as Grant Stancliffe, who hosts our, our Zoom session. So thank you to all of the tech people behind this. So it looks like our first question I will ask from Jamie Haynes is, in the sort of lull between the Civil War and World War I, what would you say is the greatest influence on shaping African-American identity nationally, given that military service has failed to advance it? Go ahead, Julie. Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, given what was going on, you know, you've got this long trajectory between the Civil War, uh, where you see this brief uptick in African-American rights, and this, this brief moment where it seems like African Americans are going to um, be able to gain more uh, civic inclusion and access to the rights of citizenship. But then it goes through this long slide downward so that by the time you get to the early 20th century, there's very little, if anything, left. And the Southern states are busily uh, writing new constitu constitutions to cement this uh, structural exclusion. Um, but a lot of development is happening within the Black community as African Americans are beginning to work through the different kinds of histories and identities that they've de developed, either as recently uh, emancipated people or people who are descended uh, from families who've been free uh, for much longer periods of time. And you're seeing um, interesting debates developing between accommodationists and those who want to be more directly challenging. And these kinds of debates really begin to shape identity and begin to shape ways of thinking about political engagement as we move forward into the 20th century. I would add to that that there's a difference between the people, how African Americans themselves see their identity, which is shaped both by religion and by um, inclusion in the economic system, um, which is really fascinating, and how they, there is the attempt to occlude them in the body politic, which tends, tends to emphasize economics and, um, and a political voice. And those, the one thing that African Americans have in this period that I find fascinating is many Americans, Euro Americans, give their loyalties to their states in this era. African Americans in this part of the, the American history are really the only pure national citizens. That is, they might give their kinship uh, and their, their traditional ties to their states, but their citizenship ties are to the federal government. And so in a way, they have more of a national identity than anybody else does. Awesome. 
Thank you both for answering your, that question. Um, our next question calls from Zara. And Zara asks, state slash asks, <laughs> Heather, thanks for your talk. Very interesting conclusion. My question, were many native folks in the 1860s and 1870s calling for representation in the US government? How did this call for representation relate to the Indian Wars at that time? That's a great question. And, and so uh, it's worth remembering that the indigenous population is not uniformly on reservations in this era at all. I mean, there are people who have refused to come to the reservations, but then there's also a significant portion of the indigenous population that has joined a, a Euro-American society that, that has become represented. And um, so I'm going to leave them out altogether right now because I think your question is more about people who are on the reservations or who are off the reservations. And no, they are not at that point really demanding literal voting representation in Congress. What most activists in the native population are doing is saying, hey, it is our land. Um, you know, get away from us. And at the same time, trying to hold the U.S. government to the, the treaties that the, the government has signed. And, and for what it's worth, treaties are not, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that treaties are, that, that, that native populations sell their land. In fact, they don't. It's not a land sale. It is a treaty that it is, that when uh, the treaties call for payments to Native Americans, for example, over time, annuities. That's not payment for the land. That's part of the contract in which the land exchange occurred. So they're really asking for those things to be, to be honored because they are trying to preserve their, um, their autonomy. And they don't really want to be part of the, the uh, American system, with some exceptions. Of course, the Cherokee uh, have split, and the Cherokee are, uh, some people are in fact engaging with the US government and others are not. But there's this, this, this almost barrier between the concept of indigenous autonomy and the US government. Now, that causes a problem within the US government, and the US go government causes a problem for that, because it is unclear in the late 19th century to people who are in the government who should have control over the indigenous populations? Should it be the Interior Department, which has the Bureau of Indian Affairs in it, which is a political system and it's political appointees, and they tend simply to be filling Indian positions with political appointees because it, it, then they can distribute contracts to supporters who are gonna in turn make sure that that party gets reelected again, or this is why Grant becomes important is because he says, screw that, we're gonna put religious leaders out there. Um, or should it be the, uh, the military? Because the military simply wants to, um, they, they don't want the, in, the Interior Department to do things because the Interior Department invariably causes trouble. Um, Indians start to uh, complain, start to be violent. And when that happens, the army has to go in and they get killed and they get really pissed off by this. And they keep saying, we should be in charge. And the Interior Department says, no, you guys are all butchers. You're just gonna kill everybody. So there's a lot of, um, of really unclear boundaries in the late 19th century in the relationship between the US government and the indigenous peoples in the American West on the plains, which is what I'm talking about. Awesome. Um, so someone is currently typing a question and I, I may ask if there's another question anyone wants to ask while this is currently happening. Um, I might just add to uh, yeah. Heather's wonderful summary of the situation for the tribes, um, that it wasn't necessarily that easy for Native Americans who had assimilated to become fully incorporated. Um, the US Supreme Court heard a case in the 1880s involving a man, John Elk, who had left his tribe and tried to register to vote as a citizen of Oklahoma. And the court found that, well, he had successfully left his tribe. Um, the state of Oklahoma had not acknowledged him as a citizen. And therefore, he was not really fully under the jurisdiction of the United States in a way that would entitle him to register to vote. Julie, what year was that? Uh, Elk versus Wilkins, I think it's 1888. Um, Ironically enough, the opinion in that case was written um, by Horace Gray, who's the author of the much more famous majority opinion in Wong Kim Ark, which declares that the descendants of Chinese born in the United States are citizens. Why do you think he does the two things differently like that? Uh, his reading of the debates 
over the 14th Amendment and his understanding of sovereignty convinced him that Native American sovereignty was sort of a special case. Um, and he kind of reads that outside of uh, the way that descendants of other sovereign nations are handled when they're within the physical boundaries of the United States. How does that, how does that coincide with ideas about um, the indigenous population in Hawaii or the Philippines? That is a real mess. <laughs> I don't know that much about Hawaii specifically, um, but one of the more interesting things I learned in the stuff that I'm doing about the Philippines is that um, the U.S. government actually tries to extend the principle of Chinese exclusion to the Philippines once it becomes incorporated as a territory, really? which, as you can imagine, was not a super easy thing to do since there were so many Chinese and descendants of Chinese in the Philippines. Um, but there were, there were a lot of efforts very early in the U.S. occupation of the Philippines to come up with these very fine-grained um, racialized taxonomies of the inhabitants there. And then Congress by, I'm going to say around 1904, 1905, had more or less thrown up its hand and said, okay, they're Filipinos. We're going to call them U.S. nationals and then figure out how nationals are not really quite citizens. Um, Bartholomew That's Sparrow has a wonderful book um, on the insular cases that goes into this in a great deal of detail. Thank you. Thanks for the recommendation. Um, so if it's all right, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, so, so Mary asks for Julie, where can one start to better understand the root of eugenics in American history? I'm particularly interested in if there are aspects of it present in the 17th and 18th century as laws regarding slavery are solidifying, but when and how does it become a science or an area of specific study? Uh, well, Heather might be able to answer this as well or better <laughs> than I can. Um, but uh, one book I really like a lot about this is Alexander Saxton's book on um, the creation of the white race. Uh, David Rodiger's book on whiteness is also helpful in this regard. Um, there are kind of different waves of thinking about race and race science in U.S. history. The first one comes in like 1820s, 1830s, uh, but the one that we refer to as eugenics um, is, is later. That's more of a, a 20th century thing, although the roots of it are in the late 19th century. Um, but uh, I could... Uh, if there's a way for me to provide resources later, I could certainly provide more resources later. Yes, um, we do send out an email after the after we've saved the recordings of our talks so that we can send it out to everyone. So if there's information that either of you two would like to give me to send out, um, we can definitely arrange that and I will send it out to all of the attendees as well as those who registered who couldn't make it live. So please continue um, answering the question. Eugenics also ties into the, the concept of evolution, which really gets its um, teeth going in America after the 1860s. So um, the, you, you see it with, uh, by 1883, you've got uh, a, a famous book in America written by a sociologist at Yale called What the Social Classes Owe Each Other. And the answer, and I'm paraphrasing, is nothing. Um, and he starts, not he starts, he is articulating what are people, people are beginning to talk about, that some people are just better than others. And it's a short step from some people are just better than others to we ought to get rid of the ones who aren't that good. And that you see obviously in lynching in the late 19th century, but also then in, um, in sterilization procedures, which by the way, lasted until the 1970s in America. Um, uh, not necessarily on books, but certainly among indigenous populations, people were sterilized. Again, with the argument that they couldn't afford to take care of a baby, they didn't know how to take care of a baby, so they shouldn't be allowed to have babies. But you can also see it really interestingly in the literature of the late 19th century. So for example, um, again in 1883, I don't know why I'm picking on that year right now, there's a book by John Hay who had been Lincoln's secretary uh, called The Breadwinners. And in it, he talks about labor agitators and people who don't really belong in society. And he almost presents them as rodents. I mean, he, that's where I learned the word oleaginous. For example, the labor organizers are always oleaginous. 
um, which means slimy and slippery. And and um, and by the time by a bit later than that, you've got the natural the rise of naturalism and literature from um, people like. Uh, Frank Norris, who is not not simply a realist like Dreiser or um, or somebody the, that really is trying to just sort of give you the facts, ma'am, just the facts, but is looking at the facts uh, of the, at the world around them and seeing a hierarchy. And um, Frank Norris, his book McTeague is about a dentist, for example, who begins as, I hate to be a spoiler here, but he starts as a dentist and he devolves to become an ape. Um, not literally, but you can tell. I mean, at one point he actually pulls somebody's tooth with his fingers. Um, and you can see it in a much more genteel fashion in people like Jack London. So in, in To Build a Fire or into um, The Little Dog, um, The Call of the Wild. Um, so um, uh, there is in the late 19th century, the, the, the meshing of the construction of race from the early 20th century with ideas coming out of England and Charles Darwin and later Richard Spencer to sort of a cultural overcoming of, you know, some people are better than others and we want to get rid of the ones who aren't. Well, thank you both so much for answering these really engaging and thoughtful questions. I'm going to start to conclude our session. And by the way, if people have more questions, please feel free to continue typing them into the chat. That way we can save them and perhaps even acknowledge them in the resources we will send out after our recording is you know, smoothed out and prepared to send out to the public. Um, learning is really important, but so is taking action. So today we're encouraging you to take a look at a few different um, organizations that you can support given the current circumstances and these questions about race, gender, and white supremacy. So first, um, I would like to talk with all of you briefly about the, um, the organization on immigrationequality.org, which through direct legal services, policy advocacy, and impact litigation advocates for immigrants and families facing discrimination based on their sexual orientation, gender identity, or HIV status. And I'm going to share this in the chat with all of you. This was recommended by um, Julie. So here is this one for all of you. In addition, Julie wanted to talk about the successor of OutServe, um, Modern Military, um, it's called the Modern Military Association of America, which is the nation's largest organization of LGBTQ service members, family spouses, um, military spouses, veterans, and their families and allies. Uh, and finally, unless um, Heather, you have anything else to add, we need to continue to fight for justice for Breonna Taylor. Um, she was a black woman who worked in law enforcement herself and was then killed by police officers in her sleep. Um, I'm going to provide a link for all of you that has many petitions you can sign. There's this wonderful person who put them all together in one website so you don't have to bop around, as well as her family's GoFundMe page, which you can help to donate to if you, um, if you are able. Um, so those are the resources we'd like to offer for today. If you've registered for this session, and you will receive an email with all of this information as well as different questions that came up during this and the recording of the video. Um, if you have not registered for today's session and would still like those materials, you can still go to our website and I will put that link in the chat as well, lighttruthcon.com, and you will receive that email if you sign up today. Um, I guess the last thing I'm going to say is I want to thank our, our presenters. I want to thank all of our tech people. Thank you to Julie and Heather for all of their wonderful insights and, and thoughtful um, answers to your questions. Thank you to Amanda and Krista for all of their hard work with the captioning. It's not an easy job and I really appreciate that you're making this more accessible to our attendees. And last, I want to thank uh, Grant Stancliffe for his contributions in making sure our tech is all running. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for participating, thinking through these issues with us. This is how we're going to move forward in, in our society and try to address issues of inequity. We need to talk about these issues together. And of course, Julie and Heather assisted us in that kind of thinking today. So thank you. And um, please come to our session next week. It's called Maintaining the Status Quo. And our speakers are Kylie Moss, Kevin Gannon, and Krista Benson. It is on July 22nd from 1 to 2 p.m. And again, you can register or you can find our link on our website on the day of. Oh, thank you everyone for your gratitude and we will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Bye everybody. Thanks so much.